Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the American Masterminds Podcast. Each episode, we invite extraordinary guests who are masters of their craft, they're innovators, entrepreneurs, and of course, motorcycle enthusiasts who have made their mark in the world. They share their stories, insights, and hard-earned wisdom, giving you a front row seat to the strategies and experiences that shape their successes. So sit back, grab a drink, and get ready for an exhilarating ride as we dive deep into the minds of these exceptional individuals. Along the way, we'll uncover powerful strategies, gain fresh perspectives, and explore the limitless possibilities of what it takes to be an American Mastermind. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the American Masterminds podcast. I'm your host tonight, Topher Sheeler. I'm here with my co-host, Mr. Rob Adams. What up, what up? We've got Scott Watson up on the sound deck this evening. And ladies and gentlemen, we have a very special guest this tonight. Uh, I think most of you, if you've spent any amount of time in the gym, you know an old man that is at the gym all the time. Our guest this evening is my old man friend from the gym, and I have the pleasure of spending at least two or three days a week with with Mr. Ken, and uh, he is full of wisdom, and tonight we are going to find out about that wisdom. Ken, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm here. (laughs) Here he is. We've got a high overview. We've already kind of gone over a little bit, and I have a lot of questions, if you're ready. So. Um, 86 years old. Yes. That means you were born in 19... Actually, I'm 85. Uh, January the 5th of next year, I'll be 86. So I'm so close to 90, 86. I might, be, might as well be 86. Uh, yeah. I was born in 1938. 1938. So you've seen some changes. You said you grew up in Chicago. Below Chicago would be about 60 miles below Chicago. Little town. A little town in the farm community called Kankakee, Illinois, which Kankakee. is an Indian name also. It means river, I believe. Oh. Hmm. Kankakee means small toes in Indian. Yeah? No, no. Um, and so that's great. And then you moved here in 1961 to the beautiful valley, and the first thing you thought was, man, i got to get out of here. i got to get out of here because I wasn't used to what was coming at me. What was that? Well, um, well, obviously Mormonism. That's a thing. That's a thing. And uh, it just was, they were too invasive. I mean, they're not invasive. In, in, uh, what's the word? Intrusive. Intrusive. Yes. And I thought, okay. And then uh, my wife's from here. Oh, well. So, so you married the Mormon girl. I I'm, I'm married a Mormon girl. And uh, I was not about to convert her to Catholicism. No way in hell I was going to do that. <laughs> because I was going to leave it up to her. Sure, sure. And so you've had a, you had a two-faith home. She uh, kind of fell off a little bit. And... Uh, so she became Catholic without being baptized. Oh, man. Subtle. Those, those Catholics are subtle. They'll get you. But ours, you know, if you want to become Catholic, you know, it's your own damn fault. <laughs> well, you said it. I'm glad uh, we started there. Yeah, that's a good great place. So we got religion out of the way. Let's move into politics. That, that doesn't mean I'm, I'm uh, against Catholicism. I'm, I'm very much Catholic. But I'm a broad-minded Catholic. I grew, on, I grew, that, grew up with, with that by just realizing that... Uh, don't swallow everything they, they tell you. Yeah. Well, I would imagine if I were a Mormon and I was raised in Rome, you know, I moved to Rome in 1961, I would have an interesting perspective about the Catholics. You know what I mean? You, you're in downtown Mormon Central. This is where we are. We're in Salt Lake City, Utah. This is the Mormon's Vatican. Yeah. Well, this is the Rome. And so it's, it's an interesting perspective. So let's start. Um, can we talk a little bit about the Navy? I, I signed up for the Navy when I was a boy, and I want to hear what you did. Well, first of all, uh, 19, uh, I graduated from high school in 1956. All right, 1956, that's only six years after uh, Korea. Yeah. And they, were, they weren't about to drop the draft. They had to be prepared for what might be coming, whether that might be, whether that, whatever that was. Early days of the Cold War. It was the beginning of that. That's right. And uh, so us seniors in high school, we knew we had to dra- uh, sign up for the draft. We had to. It was a, like a law. Right. So you had to go. Where did I go? The post office? Someplace like that. So I signed up. But I knew, we knew, that as soon as we graduated, we'd be getting that letter. Greetings. And a lot of us didn't want to, we, we were so dedicated then, we were very much for the country then. Oh, yeah. And we were just knew we were going to go. So we just got used to it. And I had uncles in the Second World War, Second World War, and one was in the uh, Europe. And two or three are in, in uh, the Philippines, or rather, the Pacific. Philippines, uh, the Pacific. And they talked me into the Navy. 
But when you're drafted, you only spend two years. I mean, they put you where they want you. Yeah. But if you volunteer, you automatically become a four-year. Oh, but I, wanted the, I wanted the Navy so bad. So I thought, I'm 18. What am I going to do? Yeah. And uh, so I signed up, and uh, I left soon after high school and went into the Navy. So you were still in Illinois. Illinois. And you joined the Navy. And yeah. did you go to Great Lakes, or did you go to San, Correct. San Diego? Correct. Uh, no, Great Lakes uh, a boot camp. Which I just found out that they used to have one in uh, San Diego. Yeah. They've closed that one now. I've heard. Yeah, it's closed now. The only one they ever have, not right now, is uh, Great Lakes. But that's they don't need a bit to them because there aren't that many going through boot camp. Anymore. Yeah, there's not. I went to Great Lakes. That's where I, I went to boot camp. Yeah. And I think some of those buildings were built way before you were even around. There are some well, built during the world, for World War II or maybe even before. Could be, I don't know. Like the beginning of World War Two. But uh, that yeah. was that was an experience because um, being parochial school was taught by nuns for mm -hmm. twelve years and discipline. <laughs> discipline. <laughs> then, well, you, uh, no, bring, ask the question what most people ask. Yeah, uh, and then you went to the Navy and they don't have nuns teaching those classes. No, they don't. <laughs> but those no nuns had uh, discipline. They were tough. When they told you to be quiet, they meant exactly what they said. Huh, what an advantage you had over the others, because they hadn't been around that level of Well, what happened there? Discipline. <laughs> I was in the, uh, uh, I was probably at boot camp maybe about a couple weeks more, maybe about a month, and we all had our showers, we were sitting around our, sitting around our skivvies. Skivvies, you know? Oh yeah, they still have those. And we're, they were bitching about, uh, oh, this is rough, this is terrible. The discipline, I said, it is. <laughs> The nuns, are, they, they, they taught me how to do it. And, uh, yeah, you, I, you don't line up straight there, and you're, you're never going to. Listen, if you turned around and looked at the back, back of the room, she was she, on you. She was on you. Amazing. So you join the Navy, um, and they have kind of a, like the sorting hat in the Navy where you take a test, and they're like, this is what you're going to do. Yes. You, you can choose it. You can choose what you want to do, but most of the time they put you where you're going to be. They put you where you want to be sometimes, and... Uh, well, boot camp was about, what, four months? Give yeah. or take, give or take. Mm -hmm. I remember. I signed up. We got to the depot in Kankakee to go up to Chicago. We all had our, our uh, uh, papers. And it must have been about, oh, gosh, it must have been about maybe 15 of us. We went up, and we got eventually got to the boot camp. Mm -hmm. And uh, we got there late. It was in civilian clothes. And they marched us over to a bunk. Uh, and uh, they said, okay, get in bed, just drive a bed, just get in bed. Here's a sheet and a pillow. A rack. Grab a rack. A rack, a rack yeah. A bed. Yeah. 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 <laughs> That's true. No. Those, those, those are words that you had to change over. Yeah, you had to learn the language. A wall is a bulkhead. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, all that stuff. So there are, they said, we're going to turn off the light and right over, pretty soon. So I just got in the, back, the bottom back rack. Good job. Good job. <laughs> <clears throat> and I sat there. 18 years old, I laid back a month on my pillow, and I said, what the hell did I do? And I started to, not cry cry, but I started, tears started to come in, and I, they were coming down and going into my ears, my tears. And all of a sudden, I just got a hold of myself, okay, okay, you got four years, so stop it. And that was the last time I did that. I was ready to go. Oh, man. So my story, very similar story. Marched us in. Um, they ran us through that night. We got grabbed the rack, picked us up in the morning, and took us down. And the first day, they shave your head. There's no. We got it the next day. You're not. You're not walking around for a couple of days with your hair. It's the next day. You're bald as a cue ball. And um, I was standing in front of the mirror, and I had a beautiful head of hair at one time. You probably don't believe that, but well, there was a time <laughs> I had. I did too. A fantastic head of hair, and they shaved me up my my head, and they marched us back. And it was that afternoon. I was standing there looking at the mirror. And my head had never been that bald. And I'm looking at my ugly head. Because you, you, don't, you don't appreciate your head when you've had a forest. When you've had hair yeah. until you don't. Just looks like a, just a terrible accident happened. <laughs> and I, I, I got emotional. I started kind of tearing up. And then I'm like, well, I'm here now. And that was it. I like It, I, it was a switch. You throw that you switch. You had in. to face it. Yeah. It's like, oh, I'm going to leave tomorrow morning and go back home. No, you're not. No, you're not. No, you're in lockdown. You're late, when you put that hand up, the right hand. I swear, blah, 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 yeah. you're in. Your property. 
Okay, you have of the United there. States yeah. Navy. Okay. Yep. You have a, you have your number stamped right on you. They label you clearly. Well, you, ne you never forget your serial number. No. Yep. I, I, I forget my Social Security number once in a while, not the serial. You got that locked in. Yep. Uh, so, what'd you do in the Navy? Well, I eventually got the uh, just before we leave boot camp, they tell you where you're going to go, and so I had to go to uh, Japan to uh, fly over to Japan and go into Tokyo. And our ship hadn't been in, came in yet. It was down in Australia going to the Summer Olympics, and uh, so we waited for it, and finally it came out, come, came into Tokyo. What was your so ship? Actually, uh, Subic Bay. What was your ship then? It was a. Uh, USS Bremerton, Washington, was named after mm. that. CA-130. CA is that a frigate? No, it was a heavy cruiser. Oh. We had a thousand men on that thing. Oh, wow. And uh, here it comes. And I boarded the ship on my birthday, January the 5th, 1957. 1957. So I'm thinking back to 1957 about <clears throat> like the, uh, you know, the Bay of Pigs and all of the different... Uh, that's, the, the Kennedy, that's Kennedy, though. The Berlin Wall crisis, all the things that were kind of happening post-Korea, pre-Cold War. There was a lot of things in the early 60s, late 50s that were going down at that time. But did you feel safe or did you feel like you were heading into trouble? No, because uh, I realized that Korea was over with. Yeah. See, Korea was uh, between 1950 and 1952. And 1956, when I graduated from high school, there was Nothing was going on. It was on. quiet. It was nothing. Huh. Uh, so, uh, Vietnam hadn't started. I think, I should have Googled this, but I think the Subic Bay was having troubles. Yeah. And that's, I think they closed it for some time because... Um, they fired they, on that, uh, what they fire on? They fired on a carrier. Yeah, they did. Something else. So I can't remember the name of it. Anyway. But, you know, all peace time. Yeah. And so uh, who was the hell, who was the president then? Uh, uh, I can't remember. I think it was um, Eisenhower. Eisenhower. That sounds right. Yeah, it was. And he said, now all you sailors, you're ambassadors for the United States. Because we weren't doing anything. We pull into the port and... Uh, Caused trouble. He, yeah, you did. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. You, let's, let's just be honest. You're wearing the American flag and you're trouble wherever you go. Well, uh, as a group, no, as a, I behave myself. I believe you did. I did. But as a whole, as a whole, in the Navy, there was places that we were getting uh, off the boat, and I was just like, this town will never be the same. No, it won't be. Yeah. <laughs> when, I, when I got on board, uh, a thousand men, there was a Catholic priest on board. Oh. Was then, you? they don't have him now, because I don't have enough of them. But uh, he was the same age as my father, and so I'd go to Mass every morning, every, every morning at 7 o'clock. To Think see the chapel. Every, every morning. Wow. And I'd get up at 6, and they'd go to Mass at 7, and get down and have chow at 7.30, and then at 8 o'clock, he had to be at work. Hmm. And, uh, and what was your rate in the Navy? I was a, I was a seaman, which is three stripes, Yep. and I was in the uh, gunnery department. Oh, a gunner. A gunner, and I hate guns. <laughs> <laughs> I do. What kind of gun did you work on? on that? Um, well, no. Because they have, they, the gunners are very specific. Like you are over the sea whiz, or you're a 16 inch gun man, or you're a, you're you're a missile six, guy. 16 inch is the heavy cruiser. I mean, uh, a battleship. The battleship. The heavy cruiser is an 8 inch. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 and then they had 8 inch, 5 inch, and 3 inch. And I had, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a Arizona, on the battleship, they had the 16, they had the 5s, and the 3s. Those 16 inch guns, boys, just in case you were wondering, one, one bullet. From a 16-inch gun weighs approximately the same as a Volkswagen Bug. Oh, it's yeah. Oh, are you that's serious? Probably, yeah, that's how much that's how much metal you're throwing down range. Oh my gosh! But yeah. the, they had black powder for that. Yeah. And ours was just a five-inch. It's probably only about I'm trying to think of the length of it, about a, a foot and a half in that neighborhood. And they had a, a powder cave behind that, and you, it's a it goes up. There's two of them in the, in the five-inch. But it's, it's covered. So Aren't it, those about? Those are about sixty pounds. Just the the, the yeah, shell. It's heavy. So, yeah, you, it's a heavy. You, had, you couldn't put the little weak weak one. Yeah. You, know, you had to get somebody that had a little muscle. Yeah. Too. One of the but big gunners. Two, well, there's two men. One put the uh, powder keg in, then they put the shell in, and then you and then you uh, push down on a level lever, and it goes up, pushes it up, and the breech block comes up and is ready to fire. Oh, okay. 
So you're almost loading it backwards, and then you put it in, when the, the the mechanism loads it in forward. Huh, that's interesting. I've never seen that. I've never seen the process of a of a big gun being loaded. When I was in the Navy, I, I was an FC fire control. Fire control. And um and I focused on the Tomahawk missiles on submarines. Missile, but see, I can know, tell right now you're you're younger. Yeah. See, we didn't have any of that. We had the old World War II stuff. Oh yeah. Our, my ship was commissioned in 1945, and they didn't use her because the, the war was all over. She's yeah. seen, uh, she's seen, no, she can't see, uh, see Viet, she, Vietnam. Vietnam. A lot of decoms after Vietnam. A lot of decommissioned yeah. ships then. Yeah. <clears throat> Interesting stuff. Well, so the um, gunners and um, my rate, the fire control guys, we didn't get along very well um, because the gunners were considered more of the. Um, like the heavy lifting, manual loading, and um, the and the, the FC guys, we thought we were smart shooting missiles and having technology and stuff like that. And so there was always a rift between us and the gunners. And they trained us in the school next door to one another. I don't know if that was done on purpose or not. And so there was always like basketball games, rival soccer games and football games. Really? We, yeah. didn't, have, we, didn't, have, we didn't have that. It was, uh, yeah. And my school, the school that I went to for FC was uh, two and a half years long. That's how long the school was. Really? Yeah, after boot camp. And you had, what, a little, oh, not quite two years later? Uh, and oh. the eight-year enlistment then. Oh, eight? You, oh, really? You, you spent eight years? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why didn't you go in for a career? Um, because I, um, I am not good at being told what to do. You didn't go to program school. <laughs> I didn't go, yeah. There was no nuns where I went to school. I, I wasn't just, good at it. I just took it. You know, I just, yeah. I just handled it very well. I could handle it. I could handle it. I just, I just struggled with it a lot. I got, um, you know what? Actually, I did really poorly at it. To be now that I think back on it, I got, I got sent to a lot of remedial trainings because I just opened my mouth and I would just be like, mm, you know, that's not that good of an idea. Have you considered maybe we should do it like this, sir? Oh man, I was too smart for my own good. But you know, I got away with shit sometimes because they consider me as the good little boy going to mass, mass every morning. <laughs> I remember one time uh, we, were, we were going to tug off and go to overseas. We spent six months in the States and six months overseas, so I took four of those. And we were about ready to leave maybe in about uh, two or three days. From shore duty? From, from Long Beach, California. That okay. was our home port. And uh, so I wanted to go see my relatives who happened to live there. And so uh, I, uh, they told us we had to be back at 6 o'clock. I thought they said 8 o'clock. Hmm. And so... I, I'm coming back from seeing my my, fa my relatives, and I walk up and there's only one gangplank, gangplank, gang, the uh, gangplank. Yeah, yeah, the gangplank. Up, there's usually there's about three of them up there. I said, what's going on? <laughs> and I walk up. I said, permission to come aboard. He says, well, sailor, you're late. You know that. Yeah. <laughs> you have to go down and see the lieutenant commander. Oh no. So I went down. He says, Ken, what are you doing here? <laughs> and I said, I told him. He says. I know you. I know you too well. You didn't do it on purpose. Get out of here. <laughs> wow, that's that is lucky. Usually, so guys, just so you know, the lieutenant commander is sitting at the duty desk, and um, everyone who's tardy comes in drunk. Like he's the he's the bad cop. You do not want to see the guy at the duty desk ever in your life. I got busted because of the duty time. desk. Oh yeah, <laughs> busted. What do you mean by busted? I became an E three a few times. <laughs> really? Oh yeah. 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 Wait, what's an E three? So he was a seaman. That's three stripes. You step into the, um, a third-class petty officer, and they get busted. And busted. Back and forth? Uh -huh. I took that test. I, I, took kept, that. I couldn't keep my mouth shut. I took that test. Mm -hmm. I was a seaman, and I thought, I'm a gunner's mate. By the, by the, by the way, a gunner's mate, you stood, stood no watches, you no KP. You were, your whole dedication was that gun. Yeah. And they didn't want you to do anything but... Take care of that gun. Clean it, paint it, polish it, all well, of you, the things. It had to be ready. Yeah. For what? But uh, that's about it. That's a pretty good duty. Yeah, it was. Yeah. But uh, I remember one time, eventually I was in control of that thing. Well, I, wait, wait. First of all, I was going to say a seaman. No way in hell I was going to do that. So mm -hmm. I studied my study, study. But during peacetime, you had to hit a certain score, like 93. Mm. And so to I took, advance. You, yeah. yeah, and so I studied, studied, studied. I got, I think I got 89 was a passing, but it wasn't 93, hmm. so I didn't make it. Yeah. Then I studied 
Really, they give it out, I think, every three months, whatever it was. And so I studied, studied, I got the 93 and oh. advanced uh, third class gunner's mate. I wanted more, well, I wanted more money, but it, it's more responsibility, though. Oh, man. So listen, when I was in the Navy, I remember um, I got out of high school, joined the Navy. I got an incentive to, to get to my, uh, my, my job. I was smart, and so they put me in a, a good job, and so there was an incentive or an increase in pay. And I got my first check, and it was like $532. Hi, Roland. And I was like, <clears throat> Mom, you can quit your job. I got you, baby. I got you. You're... <laughs> your your baby boy is made good because I had never, yeah, well, not a lot of money, but you're they're paying for all your food. You know what I mean? They pay for where your you clothes, stay. Everything, is, everything just... is paid for, and so it's just like this is money that I'm going to get in trouble with. Is almost what they're doing. It's like they're giving you incentive to to ruin your life. Most people, I I blew my money, but I I didn't do it foolishly. Like I try, I came home a lot. I would travel back and forth a lot. I enjoyed coming home for Christmas. You weren't out of the states then. No, I never. They, um, there was only two or three of us that could do my job in, and we were on the West Coast. Oh, and so that's too bad, actually. Yeah, I think I missed out on a good West Pack. You did because uh, I seen the I, as they say, I saw seen the, the world. world, man. We did. Yeah, I'm. I, so I think if I could have done that, I may have stayed in. I may have stayed longer, but like yeah. if I got another assignment in California, oh please, because we would just go out on sub tenders. The subs would pull in. We'd pull the sub in. I would go do my job, and I'd get back on the sub tender, and then we'd go home. I was, you were paying a check. Yeah. We were not paid a check. Uh, you lined up at the pay office, and they, your serial number, of course, and all that, and they paid you cold cash, brand new bills. No. And that's, that's you had it. You had it. And the funny thing about that is you hit Japan and Hong Kong and Singapore and all that stuff. And those guys, within two or three days, they didn't have a penny to rub against each yeah, other. Yeah, yeah. They bought a, I bought a silk kimono for my mom, and I got a thing, and I got a thing. And like, what are you doing? What are you doing? I did. That. Yeah. Did you do that? Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't run out of money. Oh, that's good. Yeah. That's funny. My, well, my thing is that uh, I pull into, let's say, Hong Kong, whatever it was, and they have a tour. So I thought, well, I'm going to go on that tour. Oh, yeah. I always went on the tours. Then the next night, I went out with the guys and drank. There you go. And that's where your money goes. But... Yeah, and I, I never got uh, I never got drunk until I got in the Navy. My first time I got drunk, they, uh, they, they, they we went out some drinking and all that stuff. I remember going, I can't feel my lips. <laughs> were you in Asia? What? Were you were in Asia the first time, or did you get drunk while you were still I was in? Over, overseas. Overseas. overseas yeah. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Memories. Well, they didn't really actually give us a check either. They would just say, this money's been deposited in your account. And they all, we all had, we were all part of the Naval Federal Credit Union, and we all had we our little debit card. We didn't, we didn't have that. Yeah. We didn't have that at all. Pretty high tech. It is. Well, see, then I went down and made arrangements. Uh, I said, all right, my bank and all that, I want you to send a lot of money. I didn't need money to, uh, I, had, I wanted money, but I, I didn't need the whole package. So I sent uh, more, most to my bank. And that's how I build up my, my savings there. Smart. But yeah. when I got third class, I got more money. Yeah. It's, it's not a lot, but it's more. It's, at least it's money, not screwing it off. Right. Well, that's amazing. That's a great story. So then um, you did your four years, and you're like, that's it. I've had enough. I'm out. Yeah, it, it was. Um, but they're, they take care of you. They really do. I mean, you're, you're, that's your job and all that. And uh, they wanted to make me, ask me to reenlist. No, no, no. So the day came, I packed up everything, I uh, walked to the gate, discharged papers, and he said, now you walk out that gate, you can't come back in here. And so I walked out the gate, put my sea bag down, and I was uh, waiting for, uh, we were gonna drive to Salt Lake City, and then on, I was gonna take a plane. I'll tell you what, why Salt Lake City later on. So there I stood out in that corner, I said, what am I gonna do now? Yeah. I had no job, I had money in the bank, but I had to, what was I going to do now? It's oh, like getting out of prison. Well, it was. Like, oh, it's back there. No, I can't go back in there. Do you want me back? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know where I'm going to eat. <laughs> I'm going to have to choose clothes tomorrow to wear. Yeah. All I wonder these... how many, because that's a, that's a ploy, right? 
<clears throat> they're, they're playing on that. That's why he asked you that question. Yeah. Are you sure you want to go? Because yeah. once you go, you can't come back. You can't come back. Right. I could have changed can. my name. I could have changed my right then. I could hand them over the discharge papers and say, I've decided to stay in. Once and they'd have kept you. Yeah. Well, I couldn't then. I had to go back and reassigned and all that stuff. Yeah. I couldn't. Well, they uh, took our ship away from us uh, when we got back in 1960. And we put in mothballs because mm. she was going to be done for. And eventually they scrapped her and it was done. But I, that was later though. Can I ask both of you guys a question? So Navy guys, they refer to their ship like it's a, like it's a piece of them. It's, she. It's a member of the crew. She. She is she, a member of yeah. the crew, yeah. She. I remember saying, uh, isn't she beautiful? She's gorgeous. She's... Now today I still use the word she. You know when I talk about my motorcycle... Yeah, it's she. It's a she. It's, it's a she. My, my, I have a motorcycle that's haze gray and underway. You should see it. And I, I want to get, um, I got, I want to get runner numbers on the side like they have on the ships. You oh know? yeah. So that, and I don't know, I haven't decided which ship I want to have on my, uh, my boxes because that's a big deal. But I want to have the same like I- identification numbers. What are those called? There's, uh, they have a name for those numbers. On, and, the, sh- on the side of the ship. On the ship. side of a ship, yeah. I I don't can't know remember that. anyway. Well, identification obviously is yeah. the CA one thirty, but the CA is not on there. Only the one thirty. Yeah. Big letters. Yeah. See, when you you looked at a ship in a distance, you could tell it was the St. Paul or yeah, the USS whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So do they instill that mentality with it? Like, is it is that part of the culture, or is it just that you, that's your home? Well, when you're on a. Um, the interesting thing about a ship, in my in my impression, and I'd love to hear yours, Ken, but my impression was like it was a member of the crew, and we were endlessly working on her. We were endlessly mopping, scraping, painting, polishing, endlessly. You were the deck crew. I, yeah, well, um, being one of the, like the low class men in my rank, um, I got to do all the stuff you know that the chief didn't want to do, and so it's like, hey, we're swabbing today, and you've got this area up here, and and everybody pitches in. No, there's not a time when you don't have to help somewhere in the ship in some regard where you're needed where you're needed and that's right that means you could be working in the kitchen i've, I've worked in i've peeled billions of potatoes i've done it <laughs> see that's why i wasn't because there was my whole dedication was that mount i had mount 55 yeah we had uh, we had one two three six we had six five inch 38s and we had uh i can't keep it count uh, maybe eight, uh, three, three inches. They were, they were in an aircraft. They were a little. They yeah. are. And uh, we have one, two, three, eight inch, uh, two in the front, and one in the back. Hmm. And one time they they put them they, uh, they pointed port side, all nine of them, and they said we're going to fire them all at once. You could actually feel the ship uh, pushing the, the ship. Yeah, oh, I believe it. Oh. <laughs> but it went. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you kind of black out for a second and forget your your middle name. Wait, you know what I mean? Wait. Well, you were you had to be you couldn't be that close. Yeah, yeah. you couldn't be. But even anywhere on the ship, like when that happens, when they when they drop all of them at once, that's well. First of all, you're at, at uh, um, general quarters. Yeah. You're inside anyway, except yeah. the three inch. They're not in. They're 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 out in on the open. deck. Yeah, because they're in an aircraft. They can turn everything. Up. And then plot. Do you know plot? Mm-mm. Plot is a is down in the belly of the plane, uh, ship, and uh, they can actually take over your ship, your your mount. You have to have men in there to full load, uh, load it, but they can actually take you and move it up, up and down, and they, oh. they know where that target's at out there. So they bring the ship the up or down, down, up or down, and then they, they fire it themselves. That's okay. plot. They, you, you just sit there and let them do it. You just load as fast yeah. as you can. So what happened one time... I'm on the one because I'm in charge of the whole thing. And we have these spotters on one side, have loaders on this, side, two on this, loaders and loaders. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm talking to Plot, and Plot said, "Load." I, I said, "Did I get the command? Load." So we were going around, going around, up and down, up and down, and they secure quarters. I said, "With a live Plot, load." Plot, I can't secure quarters. I got two. Two guns here, loaded. Yeah. I didn't tell you to do that. Oh. Oh, yes, you did. Yeah. And finally said, we, we'll, get, we'll take over. They pointed out way out in the ocean someplace, and they fired him. Now go down and see the lieutenant commander. What? <laughs> Again. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So I went down there, and we started to argue. At that time, they didn't have tapes. They didn't record it. They didn't record it. It was your word against theirs. His word against her. And so he looked at me. I remember him looking at me. He says, dismissed. That was it? <laughs> it. Dismissed. Oh, I boy. Guess. I think but, Ken probably got away with a lot of stuff because he was the... I was at... You're at mass every morning. Every morning, but that doesn't mean that I was the goody-goody boy. Well, those are stories oh, for the those are my, sauna. Those are my stories. <laughs> yeah. We'll, we'll share those for another podcast. Yeah, with the cameras off. Right. <laughs> Plausible deniability is what we're after here. All right, well... But I enjoy the Navy. I, I did too. And it, it made me a better... Um, I, I don't want to say man, because I was... Yeah, it made me a better man. I was a kid when I signed up, and I felt like when I let, got out, I was, I was more disciplined. I was more focused. I had you matured. I had matured immensely. Like the, I would go home and I'd be around the boys that were still my age, because now that I'm older, they're all boys. I'd be around these boys, and I'm like, you guys haven't, you haven't lived. Like you haven't seen yeah. anything. You haven't had to make like choices, and you consider mortality quite a bit. As a young man, you don't do that. But when you go into the Navy, and you're firing those rounds, you're thinking. I could kill somebody. Like that's this Where's is, it going on the other end? Yeah, this is a lethal what I'm doing is a big deal. But I was practicing. Yeah. We, we we had tugboats that would a big line out in a, in a, a, a what do you call it? A, like a barge. Barge was and a big target thing, we would fire at that. Huh. And they knew that we weren't gonna fire at the um, the tugboat because they could could control that. But I did, we did fire we, we got to fire our our, our own mount. But to make sure that we weren't going to go over yeah, to the tugboat. Yeah, shoot the tugboat. Could happen. It's the it, Navy boys. Well, it could, it could have been. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I never got to fire off any of the weapons I was trained to. Thank goodness. Those are nuclear-capable missiles. You know what I mean? Like, I'm quite grateful yeah. that I don't have to weigh that in my conscience. I don't know how that would change me yeah. to think about. The Navy's the real deal. I love the Navy. Um, I'm proud that I did it. I still feel a tremendous amount of pride um, in the country, I think because I did serve in the military. Well, even as even as crazy as life has become, I still love the United States. I still am grateful for her. Your age is talking to you. Yeah, let me hear it. Well, because uh, you had that, uh, that that when we signed up to go to the Navy, we just went. Yeah, it was like we didn't bitch about it. We didn't go to Canada. Yeah, we? yeah. We just we just took it. We we're eight, eighteen. I was eighteen. I was six one. 140 pounds. Can you imagine what that looked like? You whistled when you walked. <laughs> and so immature. I wasn't even shaving. Yeah. I, was, I was so... You were like, a boy. I was a boy. I look at my grandson now. He's going to be 18 pretty soon. I'm looking at him. I said, that's when I went in the Navy. Yeah. And I did go in the Navy. And uh, that was it. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, when I got out, I took a picture. I went to see my aunt uh, the day I was going to go in. And the day I got out, you put those two, two pictures together, doesn't even look like the same person. Different went, person. Boy, I went from 140 to 180. Wow. Huh. But not, no fat. It just... It just you became it. a man. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, let's fast forward. I want to jump ahead. Um, I could talk about the Navy all day. I really yeah. could because there's so many stories. And um, do you see, did you ever, and did you have, remember that one? Yeah, all those things. But what I want to talk about is something that Topher brought up. I, I'm a little bit of a gym rat. I love to work out. And uh, I think I've got my, um, my discipline or exercise regimen from like when I was in the Navy. Because you, you exercise, they exercise you regularly. If you want to or not, you're, you're going to do PT every now and again. No? Man, I, I was in a different Navy than you. You were in a different Navy because uh, that was never, never brought up. We, uh, we, that was never done. In boot camp, I did a lot of it. A lot of it in boot camp, and I thought I was going to do it. We never got in line and marched anywhere. We never did that. Hmm. They, uh, they tell you to go back on, get off the ship and go on the dock and get in line, maybe. For an inspection, but that was about it. Something like that. that, that well, there's inspections different. Yeah. <laughs> but I remember one time, they, uh, I, was, we, we were, I was in the 5th Division. And they have muster and all that. You have to go up there. And the admiral was coming by, going to come and inspect us. So he went in between lines, and he called me up front. Tell me, turn around, look at the uh, the guys. Uh, they said, next time, I wish you all looked like this guy. What? <laughs> but that's pressure because I know I was going to get shit when I got. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> you son of a bitch. Yeah, good job. Good job, Allie, over okay. there. Done with that. Um, so here we are at the gym. You're going to the gym regularly. Why, are, why are, at your your mature age are you attending the gym so regularly? There's a lot, there's a lot of young people that don't go. I know that. But uh, in order to somewhat stay young and uh, keep it going, you have to. Uh, you, I don't use heavy weights, though. I have six machines I work on, and I don't go over 30 pounds. So it's more reps? Yes, that's right. It's just movement is the main thing. You keep it going. Do you spend time stretching? Do you spend time, like, staying limber? I don't limber? stretch other than um, on the machine. <laughs> that's my stretching. That's all I do. All right. Topher stretches a lot. Yes. A lot. And which is, you know, that's his, his, his thing, and mine is just keep six, six machines going. My female doctor, she said, at your age, exercise, but don't go over 30 pounds. Okay, fine. Okay. Sounds good. Fine. And in your exercising, um, have you come across, have you had health problems along the way? Have you had heart problems or high cholesterol? Like you I seem am like you're so in great shape. healthy, it is beyond belief. Yeah? I just took my blood pressure, 129, 124 over 72. And I took the second one, it was 109 over something. And I don't think... No medication whatsoever. No prescription medication at all? Nothing. You take vitamins? I take vitamins. Is there a vitamin in particular that I need to be taking? Because I, I would I, like to live to be I'd have to 86. Look, I'd have to look at my billfold yeah. because my wife buys the uh, vitamins I take them. I have a very similar experience. Why not? Yeah. She, my wife told me I'm going to live to be, she's going to keep me alive until I'm 112 <laughs> and this is how we're going to do it. And she's got like a plan. Which, so despite my best efforts, I'm going to be around a my long time. My grandson, who is, like I said, 17 now, and he says, Grandpa, you're going to live to be uh, 95. I know you are. I said, I'm afraid I am. <laughs> <laughs> but my eyes, I had cataracts. I have uh, perfect 20 20 vision now because I had them changed. Wow. Um, I, never, I never have gone over 180 ever in my whole life. In your weight? My weight. And... Uh, I have a little bit of a gut, but I think that's a little aging. Not big, but it's there. That's about it. So does longevity <clears throat> running your family? Are you, a, are you a, a, a product of or an anomaly? Okay, I was raised in an era of smoking. and uh, Doctors smoked in the office. In the barber shop. Yeah, oh yeah. They would come in the barber What's he smoking? Well, we didn't think that right, that way that yeah. Smoking's fine. Yeah. Smoke. My mother said, my mother smoked like a chimney. My dad sort of smoked. And, uh, but I never picked up. I mm. never picked up cigarette smoking. It's kind of amazing because uh, it's like one of the main pastimes of the Navy. You could get tattoos, learn how to swear, I or smoke. A, I never got a tattoo. You never got a tattoo. No, you still don't have one. I don't have one. You are a unicorn. The only thing I was going to get... <laughs> Oh, I was afraid to go anyway. You'd get drunk, and then we're going to get me tattooed. So I had to stay sober, slightly. But I was going to get one tattoo, a pair of lips on my butt. But I never doubt, and I never did it. It's not too late. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes. <laughs> but uh, I got a guy. We can jump on her. I'll take you there now. We'll go do it. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Well, all right. So what is the secret then? Um, in uh, in maintaining health, um, you come from an era. I, the smoking in the Navy. I was in the Navy. I'm not that. I'm 53. And 53. My son's 60. And so, if smoking was still a big thing in the Navy, we, I would walk into the break room and I would have to walk to the other side of the break room to find my friend. I couldn't see him across the break room because the smoke was so thick. Really? Oh yeah, it was thick. And I got home from the Navy, and my mom was like, "Are you?" Have you taken up smoking young Rob raised in, you know, Mormon? No, mom. Why would you say that? I smelled, I reeked of cigarette smoke. Oh, wow. Because I was just around it. It's just, that's how it is in the Saturated. Navy. Saturated. In the hair, too. Yeah. And I think I um, actually was addicted to it. I think I smoked vicariously just by being, hanging out you with... You had secondhand smoking. Yeah. I would get my little fix and when I got home, I'd get headaches. Now, and... you were smoking in, in the ship. Uh, didn't you have designated places to smoke? Yeah. You have to go back up on the, on the back deck to smoke. Yeah, or you uh, could uh, smoke in the uh, uh, compartment at the big place where you, where you wrote letters, the big table. You yeah. only smoke there. Yep. And then when they had, uh, they said the smoking light is out. That meant on the ship, you couldn't smoke anywhere. Anywhere. Period. 
Were you that, in the that, Navy when you could still have a beard? I think you were in the Navy when you could still have a beard. Beard? No. No, you couldn't have a beard back then? No, you couldn't have a beard. Uh, one, we were out to sea for a long time. And the, the Admiral, we had, we had the Admiral board. He was, he, uh, we were his flagship. Mm. So that, that's, that was the seventh fleet out there in the Pacific. Mm. So he's in charge of that whole Pacific, and we were his flagship. So we're going to be out there for a long time. He got, he got on the, the speaker and said, Being that we're going to be out here, you can grow beards. Hmm. So we started to grow beards. Well, he took a walk around the deck one time, but two weeks later, he said, got on the microphone and said, beards are off. He <laughs> changed his mind. <laughs> I changed his mind. And I was hardly shaving. <laughs> I've got a picture, <clears throat> and now I'm, I'm, I look up like a bear. i got hair on my chest all over the place. And I was very late maturing. Uh, in the Navy, um, when I was in the Navy, you couldn't have a beard because you'd wear these. Um, if there was an emergency, I was part of the emergency uh, response team. You'd wear these oxygen breathing apparatus devices, and they was enriched oxygen, and it would get into your beard. This like uh, oxygen, straight oxygen. It wasn't just like mixed. Like we're not, we don't breathe, breathe straight oxygen. Right. And so we would have you'd have that in their beard, and then people would go out on a smoke deck and light up, and they would catch on fire. They called them flaming alphas. And so they had to get really? rid of, yeah, they had to get rid of beards. Like even, um, huh. even if you were out at sea, cause that's kind of the habit. Like once you're out at sea, you guys are underway. Meh, we're going to, we're not that worried about it. When we pull in or when we're on shore, everybody should clean up because you are a representation of the fleet. We had to, because of the bad board. We, yeah. we had to shine. Yeah. So on other ships, that is not the case. And so they had, they had to get rid of them because mm. people were catching on fire. Wow. Huh. Cool story, huh? Yeah, that is cool. Well, unless but, you're the guy catching tell fire. Tell you one, one story. You I want told, a told, uh, uh, stof, uh, kof, Topher. Uh, hmm. We were docked in uh, Long Beach at the dock. And that, well, the captain came aboard and he said, uh, now the USS Nautilus, do you know what that is? The Nautilus, yeah. Okay, it's the first not, uh, nuclear submarine. Yeah. You know, they named it after that uh, Jules, Jules. Jules Burns. Jules, is it? Yeah. Was, yeah, something the, like The Seven he, Leagues. He or named his, the, the Nautilus. Yeah. So he said, now, oh, the Nautilus is coming in. There'll be no pictures taken, period. Huh. That, okay. And that's okay. I went way on the top of the top of the ship and looked down and took pictures as it was coming in. Did you? <laughs> uh, 571. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Ken has uh, a thing for taking pictures. You have a lot of pictures. I have a lot of pictures. Oh. I mean, what I do is I, uh, we run around with about four Catholic couples, and we'll go to lunch, but whatever, and I'll take pictures of them, and just give me five pictures, and I can make a whole video out of it. And I'll put the title, the music, and I, I, I'm, pre- I'm pretty good at it. Yeah? Making your own videos? <laughs> yeah, our own videos, and uh, birthdays, blah, 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 whatever, uh, outings and all that and a title and music and crop them, I crop them. You have to do it before you put it together though. And it's all ready, then you could put the whole thing together. It takes, it takes time to do that. Yeah, it does. That's yeah. cool, that's a cool hobby. Yeah, it is. Well, all right, so back to the fitness. Um, yes. what, what got you to the gym? Like, have you always been a gym guy? Not, well, back in, uh, when I was 35, uh, the gym then was in Sugar House. On the corner, right in the main corner of Sugar House. What was the name of that place? Man, that it's like a famous. It's a like a. It was a landmark. Like it was the but gym. But it's not there anymore. Yeah, it's gone. It's gone. What had happened is uh, they they had one big gym, dressing room and everything. So they had Women's Day, Men's Day, and that Monday, Wednesday, and Friday was men's, and the other one was women's. They were closed on Sunday, so that's where I started, and I could only go on Monday because I was. That's because my day off in barbering was on Monday. So that's when I started back then, and I just have done it ever since. So that was 1960. Well, let me think about this. Seven, uh, you were out of the Navy? Well, no. Uh, uh, we were married, and so it had, we got married in 1961, so it must have been about. She's working for a finance company, and uh, they, were, uh, they dealt through her company to, uh, for the memberships. Mm. So he gave us both lifetime memberships. Oh, how cool. We paid, I don't know, $75 each. For a lifetime membership? Lifetime, and I still use it, by the way. I, I pay nothing at the gym. And so... Who honors that? Where, where? Well, you have to have a contract. There's a contract. And uh, Gold's Gym was going to take over a particular gym that I was going to. And they said, uh, if you don't have a contract, you're out. Yeah. So Shirley, Shirley, my wife, she went, dug it up, 
presented it to Coach Jim. He said, oh, you're in. But she saves everything. <laughs> Holy cow. Are you serious? Yeah. You don't, you have a, a lifetime, lifetime membership, membership to the gym? I don't pay nothing. Are you serious? Nothing. <laughs> That's so cool. That's but awesome. you know what's happening with that? <clears throat> a lot of the older men are dying. And pretty soon that... I'll probably be the last one. Yeah, can you grandfather that? I'll they'll take you up on that. <laughs> for seventy five bucks. For seventy five bucks, I'll buy it right I'll, now. I'll, 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 I'm doubling down. I'll double down. <laughs> but you'd have to talk to uh, Vasa for that. Yeah. yeah, I didn't know that. That's amazing. You didn't know? I didn't know that. Yeah. <clears throat> Very cool. Well, I appreciate um, the commitment to fitness. I. Um, as I have grown older and I see these older gentlemen in the gym, I think to myself, that's, I'm, I'm on my way. I'm going to be that guy that's doing that and, um, making friends with everybody, giving them the finger. Hey, I'm good, good yeah, that you yeah. made it, you know, and you should what? watch Ken walk through the gym. It's pretty, it's yeah. pretty comical. <laughs> Celebrity level. <laughs> yeah. I believe that. I, some guy was, I was going to talk to you, but he was talking to somebody else. But, uh, but I picked that up in barbering. You have to realize that. Because in 40 years, uh, you come in, uh, you cut hair. I was fortunate to be on the East Bench, and our clientele were, uh, was presidents of the, presidents of the university, uh, uh, a lot of the apostles. I cut a lot of the apostles of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Sure, sure. And uh, a lot, I had a ton of Catholic priests I cut. I, I did a lot of the clergy. I did the rab, cut the lab, uh, rabbi's hair, Episcopal priest, Lutheran priest. Uh, a lot of de denominations hmm. and uh, a lot of Mormon missionaries coming back. And uh, I remember they'd come in, I cut their hair with little boys, now they're going to go on a mission. Then it was 19, yeah. now we changed to 18. And they said, Ken, should I go on a mission? I said, You're asking me, Catholic Barbara, should go on a mission? <laughs> I said, Yes, go on that mission. Now, I think um, I've thought a lot, I, I also served a mission for the church, and I think that everybody should do some service. If it's not for our church, it should be for the country. The Peace Corps, I don't care. But at that age, it's important that you learn that yes. you're not the only thing in the universe that matters. That's right. And that service is the secret to happiness. It is. It yeah. really is. Well, then I realized I was cutting you know, Russ Bowler's hair, Neil Maxwell's hair. <laughs> um, and I cut uh, uh, President Kimball's hair. Oh, man. He was my favorite one. Yeah. I, and I was How was he? Was he a nice man? Oh, he was a, well, I treat him like he was just a little old grandpa. Yeah, he That's looked like he Yoda. Was. And uh, I was cutting his hair when uh, the blacks were giving the priesthood. Oh. 70 something, I think. Six. 76. And that day I'll never forget as long as I live. We had six barbers, quite an exclusive barbershop, and the door flew open that one morning. He says, The blacks have the priesthood. priesthood. And, and then another guy, it was, it was a big circus. And uh, that was it. And I was cutting his hair at that time. I never asked him about it. Huh. I didn't have that. I just knew it, it happened. I, and I. So how'd you get into barbering? Like, so you were <clears throat> been a gunner. You were doing all these things, and now. What I did there, before I went in the Navy, I had a young guy that was cutting my hair out of high school. And I thought I talked to him about it. I said, you know, I've got to go in the Navy. And I've got to get a career. And he said, go to barbering. So eventually, I got here to Salt Lake and went to the old trade tech on. Uh, fourth South and off of Seventh. That's where it was. It's just an old big building. Yeah. And what it's interesting that the buildings you're referring to no longer exist. They don't exist. <laughs> yeah. A lot of stuff don't exist. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. So you went to the barbering school. Barbering school was what? Seven months? A year? No, no, no. It was, it was a school year. Nine months. Nine months. And you had regular classes. <clears throat> and so we had a class at the beginning of the uh, the day about diseases. Uh, uh, Circulation of blood, th things we're not going to use. Yeah, yeah. But then eventually we went to the barber shop, which had about maybe tw uh, 12 chairs, something like And you had to start cutting hair. They just threw some shears in your hand and oh, away you went. Yeah, you did. The instructor was there to help you a little bit. So eventually I, I, uh, I graduated and I had to look for a job. So I went back to the school and fortunately he said uh, the second uh, instructor was there. He says, they just have an opening up at Foothill Village hmm. to go up there, and he's looking for a barber. So I went up there, and I looked so much like a return missionary. I was just clean cut. Right and this way, young man. I, yeah. I walked in. He said, how soon can you start? I said, any time. He said, start tomorrow. I didn't know what time of bar kind of barbershop it was in. And all of a sudden, here comes the governors, the mayors, the doctors, the lawyers. I thought, what the hell is going on? I got slightly 
shook up because yeah. I, I never. These are these I, are big wigs. Yeah, and the president of the university and all that stuff, and the professors. Would you know who they were? Were they like sit down? And, My name at is. At first, I didn't because I didn't know any, any of that. Yeah. Because I was still fresh in Utah. Yeah, yeah. But you soon soon find out who they are, like uh, James Fletcher. Mm-hmm. Do you know who I'm talking about? I know the name. Okay. Uh, I cut a lot of professors. They said, we're getting a new uh, president of the Uni- University of Utah. Mm-hmm. And I said, what's his name? He says, James Fletcher. So I'm cutting hair, and this man comes in, sits down, waiting. I get him in the chair. And I said, are you new in town? Huh? He said, yeah, I'm just, I come to Salt Lake to pick up a job here. And I said, what kind of job is that? And he said, over at the school. I'm going to be the president of the University of Utah. Oh, he said it. Okay. Oh, he said it. I said, oh, you're James Fletcher. You know my name? I said, of course I do. Because I got, it's all, all in front of me. Wow. I, had, I had him for seven years. He was, he was, you were his barber. I was his barber from then on. And he came in one day and he said, uh, I'm going to quit the university and NASA, NASA is going to pick me up. That's right. And he went to uh, Cape Kennedy and he took over that. Bro- and, kind of brought him back on task. Yeah, I did. Because that's what he did. That was his job. Yeah. That was his job before. So he knew I went to see my parents there, and they had a home, winter home there. So he said, come and see me. Oh, cool. So I went and seen him at the Cape Canaveral. How cool was that? It was. Cause yeah, Cape Canaveral. Cape Can- but John Huntsman was the same way. Oh? Uh, he came in one day, and I got him. I knew he was just a businessman, okay? Got him in the chair, and, and we were just BSing, talking, talking, talking. I said, the dome at the university or where they play basketball, they just finished it. And we were talking to him a lot. And he said, yeah, they're going to name it after me. <laughs> I said, Can you believe that? Why are they going to name it after you? He says, because I just gave him several million dollars. I think it was a million. It oh, was yeah. A lot of money, whatever, whatever the price was. I said, oh, that's a good reason. That's a solid reason. And we reason. became buddies. And he let me come up. My wife and I go to the always parties at the at John Huntsman's when he had parties. And he let us go up to the Delta Center to see all the games how and nice that's where i met thomas monson tommy well did you call him thomas well mr monson no because he's an apostle just an apostle then okay and we we hit it off he'd come in we go go out bs and all that and uh he came up to me one day and he said call me tommy and i couldn't do it <laughs> yes sir mr monson <laughs> no, not, yeah. no no thomas thomas um, okay thomas and that's where I met Nelson also. You, you knew Mr. Nelson. Well, he was a surgeon. Yeah. And he, he dropped it because it became, then he became an apostle. Right. Uh, good guy, but very quiet and very dry. Serious. He was a serious very, character. He just, okay, that, there's not going to be a lot of excitement here. Yeah. He was very analytical. That's probably why he was a good surgeon. But he's uh, intelligent. Yeah. Sharp. And uh, you're German. Who thought? Yeah. He's, Peter. Yeah, he, uh, I like him because I, I watch conference once in a while. He delivers quite well. Yes. He's not like the regular. He's a storyteller. Yes, he is. I got to meet him at John Huntsman's uh, parties. Oh, really? And he was over in the corner one time, and I, I knew who he was. I knew all the apostles. And uh, he kind of started coming, and I thought he was going to go somewhere. He'd come right at me. Huh? Hi, how's it going? I remember, I'm fine. And I met um, Donald Oaks there, too. Huh? That's very De- cool. De- my mom had a crush on Peter. Why is U- Uchtdorf. Oh, she really? was yeah, she's German. She <clears throat> she's fresh off the boat from Germany and she just thought he's the he's the most handsome apostle. Oh, mom, <laughs> knock it off. One of my apostles just died. Russ Ballard. Russ, yeah. I got his for twenty years. Russell M. I call him Russell all the time. I call him Neil Maxwell. Neil Maxwell, when he first came in the barbershop, I knew who he was. I said, Elder Maxwell, may I help you? He got my chair and turned to me. He says, Ken? I said, yeah, my name's Neil. <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> it was, but I loved the man. So not to, I don't want you to talk trash on anybody because that's not what this is, uh, podcast is about. But was there anyone that came in that was surprisingly not friendly that you would think would be that came through? There, there has been a lot of experiences like that. Yes, and they had names. And I, See, I don't give names. Don't name names. I don't. No, I don't. Because but, that would ruin my my. Uh, profession hmm, interesting and but they, but it like common like people that are like big like just like people the that are prominent prominent people i can uh, name one and i'm not gonna name him but his name rhymes with hmm? 
Well, well yeah. <laughs> no, I won't do that. See. All they, right. They knew I. They knew they were safe with me. Yeah. Like one time, a, a, a lawyer comes in, and kind of loudly, we had six barbers there. He says, "Ken, I've got a question to ask you. I want you to tell me the truth." The barber in the back says, "Don't ask Ken. He'll, he'll tell you. The he'll truth. tell you the truth." And I did. I was gonna pussyfoot around. Yeah. Man. Yeah. <clears throat> Well then, so then the next question is, is when you're cutting hair, like what was one of the experiences you had that was kind of a surprise? Like there, it's not always, you know, rainbows and unicorns. There's like some crazy, go ahead, I'm ready. I went through so many divorces, affairs, um, um, just, uh, just people spill young, their guts. Young, young uh, I want boys coming out to me. Okay. Because they trust me because they're little boys and they would, and I said, the first thing out of my mouth is, have you told your parents? Yeah. Have you seen your dad? Talk to your dad. You've got to do that. Yeah. I encouraged him, I encouraged him. My missionaries did that, some of that too. Now that, that's not naming names now. No, no. Just, okay. Matt, nah, I appreciate that. It seems to me um, that the era, uh, era, era of having a, that's my barber. Yes. Is, is not, it's not a thing anymore like it used to be. Well. Is it? Yeah, no, it's not because I think the transition there, uh, men were barbers and women were beauticians. Beauticians. Mm -hmm. Be they used to call them beauty shop, a beauty, be a beautician, or something like that. Yeah, yeah. They don't call them that anymore. But that, I think that changed a little bit. I think I'm not. I don't know. I, I didn't have the experience of that because I was man to man. Yeah. And that's uh, that's all it was. And right. they, they trusted you so well, so much. In fact, one time we were up at the Alto, a long time ago. Shirley and I were hiking, and we knew a, a bar that down in uh, Alta, so we went up through the back door. And when you go from bright light to dark, I couldn't see the hand in my f front of my face, and the door was closed. I started to adjust, and was one of my customers sitting at the bar. He wasn't with his wife. Dun, dun, dun. He looked at me, and I looked at him, and he said, this is our secret, isn't it? I said, yes. Yes. And he knew he could trust me. I'll see you next week. Yeah, sure. I expect a really nice tip. Yeah. <laughs> I know that's threatening though yeah yeah just a but you make your own choices but, sir but I went through a lot of um, sad but true I averaged almost a suicide a year that you knew the person well I was cutting their hairs yeah or if I if I missed that year somebody else uh, one of the six had a, a suicide interesting and all all types you know you, you pick on one area we are in Mormon land of course, that would lean more towards the Mormonism. But uh, there was a Catholic young man that committed suicide. Uh, we had a dentist. There was, a, I, I, I have to be careful there. That's all I'm going to say. And uh, in fact, two of them, uh, psychologists, psychiatrists. Hmm. Um, uh, talking about psychiatrists and psychologists, they're having a big meeting up there at the university all together, which I didn't, I didn't know they did that, but anyway, they were all done. So they, one got up and said, I gotta go get, a, go get a haircut. And they said, where do you go? I go down to Foothill and get Ken. <laughs> we do too. Huh. Not all of them, of course, but yeah. they said, we should give Ken an honorary degree into psychology. He, <laughs> he has more patients than I've got. <laughs> <laughs> That's a little truth. That is, that. I can see that being a little true. Uh, huh. So how did you, um, so I'm a big believer in energy, people coming in and out of your chair all day, all day, unloading, talking to you, just dropping on you some heavy yeah, things sometimes. a lot of heavy things. So how did you stay centered? How did you keep your balance? Because I made it interesting and I was allowed to uh, comment and uh, I, sometimes I was brutal, but they asked it in a brutal way. Question. Yes, for brutal truth. Brutal truth. And like one young man, I cut his hair and he got married. Down the line, he got divorced. Now, this is a long time period, though, over it. Got married again, got a divorce. Got married again, got a divorce. This is over a period of me, 10, 12 years now. And so the last divorce, he got in the chair and he says, talking about it, he said, What do you think it is? I said, It's you. It's you, buddy. <laughs> he never came back. <laughs> that'll that'll ruin a customer. It did. I knew it was going to do it, but I was going to be around the bush. Yeah. yeah. Common denominator in all of these math problems is you, right? Yeah. It's, I had to let him know that, come on. And then one time, this guy, little guy, 
he gets a great big truck and piles it in front of the barber shop. He had, damn had to get a ladder to get out. Dropped out, got a haircut. Why, he said, come and see my truck. He said, come out there. And he got, wants to go, can, should I help you? <laughs> I should not have done that. Oh. He never came back. Yeah. That's funny though. <laughs> Simple. <laughs> yeah. Well, some of the best jokes will do that. <laughs> That's why I got busted <laughs> once. But the jokes. That's why you met the guy at the, at the gate? Yeah. <laughs> that joke's so really, funny. That joke where I, I get a joke. And most, of, most of them work absolutely filthy. They're just close to it, but not totally. On the line. On the line. And I'd use it, use it, use it. And, and that guy didn't. Oh, you told me last time. I killed the joke. I just literally threw it on the floor. Yeah. I didn't it's use old it. material. It's it, time it, for some new stuff. Well, I didn't know when I, who I last. But when he said it, and then I said, okay, I've got to do it. Another joke. Here comes another joke. Yeah, that's good. That is good. Well, all right. So, um, so was it? It was just a combination of like you just didn't internalize. You just kept everything in front of you. The person you're having a conversation you with. You take it home. You take it home. You would. You would take some of those that stress home. Yes. Huh? Because they were dramatic, and I, you know, you, they were fly by night. They were. I cut their hair maybe 10, 12, 13, 14, 15 years, and they were going through divorces and. The wife would come in, and I'm not gonna, I can't use the names, but uh, I was doing this young, this man, and his wife come in with the kids, and, and she had to go to a psychologist? Yeah, yeah. And uh, I was doing the psychologist, I was doing the, fa the husband, and she was having an affair with the psychologist. Nope. And I just prayed that the psychologist and the husband didn't come in at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> so they knew each other. Of course, of course they knew they each did. other. And I thought, I, do, I don't know how I would handle it. But they never did. Thank God. Wow. That's interesting. Interesting stuff. Um, as you, uh, as I've grown older, one of the things I started to do was I would be at a, at a party or an event or something like that. And I would look for the most senior gentleman in the room, which more often than not now is turning into me. But... I would go up no, to the. No, you're not. No, you're not there. <clears throat> uh, surprising! I'll look around and I'm like, I'm the oldest guy at this party. <laughs> yeah, it's but just in this room. Yeah, <laughs> you're not that old. And so, um, what I would do is I would go up to them and I would ask them this question, and this is the question I would like to ask you. Are you ready? Fine. Tell me something true. Tell me something true. Tell me something true. You've been around for a minute. You've got golden nuggets. You've learned a few things along the way. I want to know something true. True. Um, life is there. Enjoy it. Life is there. Enjoy it. You know, really, sadness. <clears throat> you bring on sadness on yourself sometimes. Not mm. all the time. But a lot of times, you're, oh, I'm sad. Well, what the hell are you sad for? Get out of it. Yeah. And uh, be kind. Um, like everybody. Um, times have changed on that, though. I can remember way back, way back when. I remember when World War II ended. I remember when Roosevelt died, <laughs> April the 12th, 1945. Wow. My dad had his tonsils out that day, same day, so I got somebody to relate to it. Oh, well, there you go. I ran up. He was coming home on the bus. We didn't have a car. And I ran up to him. I said, Ro President Roosevelt just died. <laughs> I remember the end of World War II. My dad had... Uh, Three brothers and one brother-in-law in the na in the army or the military, they all came home. So he went out in the in the front of the yard and took his shotgun and shot fought four shots up in the air for them each one. Can't do that anymore. It's frowned upon. Yeah. Well, on the farm in the middle of Illinois, you can get away with a little yeah, bit more. Yeah. Yeah. We were gonna live we were living in the city then. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, nope. yeah don't do that yeah. in the city. But that's the best thing that ever happened to me right there is moving from the city to the farm. Hmm. I became a, a farm boy immediately. That'll that'll toughen you up. It did, and uh, but you you rely on all the farm boys, farm guys, and you got farm girls, and uh, we had a hell of a good time. That's great. Like a Mark Twain. <laughs> Those were the days. Well, let me ask you this: as you um, you look back on young Ken fixing to join the Navy or um, coming out of the Navy, and he's standing there on the curb with his with his uh, sea bag and. You know, he's in his, uh, I don't know if it was the wintertime when you get out, you get your blues no, it was, on? Uh, September. S September, so you're wearing your whites. Oh, whites. Yeah. I've got a picture of me coming off the plane. By the way, you got off the plane, you walk down. 
They, were, they didn't have those fancy things to go out. Yeah. My, uh, my dad taking a picture of me getting off the plane, and there I, that was it. I took off the uniform when I got home, and that's the last time you wore it. Last time you wore it. What advice would you give that young man getting uh, stepping out on that curb? You can't come back. Can You can leave, and you can't come back. You're out there now, and you have that moment of like, oh, crap. Okay. What advice would you give that young man? Well, get a profession uh, because I didn't have one other than the Navy, and I just had a, uh, a high school di diploma in my, my hand, mm -hmm. and I had to make up my mind what I was going to do, and I met my wife a couple of days or about a month after I got, um, no, just before I got discharged. Uh, so I met her, and uh, what, what, did, what, what advice would I give myself is move on try to do good and try to get into, uh, go to school or go to get a profession, whatever it may be. And I thought, well, mine was barbering. I was gonna definitely get go to barbering. And then we, she came to Salt Lake City to get to marry me. We got married in the Catholic Church and all that stuff. Then we came back to Salt Lake and I entered it into the barber school. And nine months later, I was a barber. And you did barbering ever since. The question then uh, that um, I've been on, I'm on my third wife. I'm just going to admit it right here on the air. And you said you've been married to your girl. 62 years. 62 and years. And Shirley is an amazing, amazing woman. What's the secret? How did you keep How that you going? How did you do that? How did you get Shirley to begin with? <laughs> now that's, a, that's a good question. Well, uh, see, I was in the neighborhood with her brother. And we were about, uh, about three months away from being discharged. And he said, she's coming out with two other secretaries. <laughs> and said, so, would you, can I line her, her up with you? Because he trusts me. It was good. And uh, so the other two, he got one of the other girls and we got another sailor. We just had a hell of a good, good, good time. I was so broke, we, she wanted to go to Disneyland. And I said, well, I don't have, she, you know, she paid the whole damn ticket. But I remember the first time I ever seen her. Uh, she pulled up in the uh, Long Beach parking lot. She couldn't come on the base. <clears throat> and so she got up. She was sitting in the back, back seat, one, two car garage uh, doors. Yeah. They don't, I don't think they make them as much as they used to. And the first thing came out was her butt coming out. And she turned around and had that beautiful face. Like, Shit. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then we started to. Uh, Went to the beach started went to, with the butt. Yeah. Well, if she had to come out. A lot of times she had to come out that way. You had to wiggle out. Yeah. So we went to the beach. We went to Disneyland. We went to Knoxbury Farm. And we, uh, when I say we made out, we just kissed. Just uh, kindergarten stuff. And uh, so she had to leave. Went back. And I wrote the first letter to her to Salt, in Salt Lake City. That you'd ever written? Are you were the first one to write? I was the first one to write. Okay. Then she wrote back. Gotcha. We started to correspond. I have a whole uh, container of love letters. Wow. <laughs> That's amazing. And uh, it was love. It was just, call it physical love. Sometimes that's the first thing you, you, you reach into. You see that physical love. And then you reach that, uh, you realize you're, you're, you have an intelligent woman here. And uh, so... <laughs> There's a real person behind that That's beautiful a real face. Behind that face. And so, uh, remember I told you I was standing on the corner waiting? Well, yeah. I got in the uh, car with some buddies, and they drove me to Salt Lake City, and I stayed with her brother and her family, because uh, he had been on leave also. So we all met. And I stayed three or four days, and I flew home. I was home, and I started to write letters again. We wrote letters. We, would, we wrote every day. And... Uh, I talked, I called her on the phone, and I said, would you marry me? On the phone, you <laughs> on asked <the> her? Phone. <laughs> and so she said, yes, I will. So she gave up everything. She her a car. She, she lived with a bunch of gals, a woman, a bunch of girls. And she got in the, I, I gave her a plane ticket. We remember, we only met those few times. And uh, she flew out. My mother, dad, and I went and picked her up. And she stayed with my, my parents. There's three bedrooms. Mine was the uh, one end, hers the other end. My mother and dad was in the middle. <laughs> oh, no. On purpose. Yeah, that was no accident. No. <laughs> and, uh, what is it? 
October, October, and then we um, got engaged uh, Christmas Eve. We we're going to go to Mimir and Pipir. That's mother and grandma and grandpa. Hmm. I'm French. Okay. And uh, and I gave her the key of the uh, engagement ring in the car and all that stuff, proposed and all that stuff, and we drove to the party. And we showed the, the, the engagement ring, and then uh, we went to the priest. We arranged our wedding on April. During Easter time, during that time period, you couldn't get married during Easter time. You had to wait. So we got the first Saturday after Easter, April the 8th, and uh, we got married. It's like that. 62 years? Was it? 1961. How many years is that? 1961. This is 19... Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 62 years. It is 62? Yeah. So coming up be 63 in April. April, the, uh, her birthday's on the 4th, and we got married on the 8th. So I never get my... I just have to make sure what card I give her at the time. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the... So you've been married for 62 years. Yeah. What's the biggest... If you were to give our, our listeners one piece of advice for keeping a relationship going, what would it be? Oh gosh, uh, just love and respect, and just uh, listening. That doesn't mean we don't call each other, you know, go to hell or something like that once in a while. We we get pissed off even today sometimes. We well, but what happens there is that uh, we'll and we separate a little bit, and all of a sudden she'll say, "Let's go shopping." Okay, it's over. It's just we don't. Does it go on and on and on and on and on? So she, so she doesn't hold, um, she doesn't hold a grudge. She's not like keeping no, score. No, no, no. And you're not keeping score. No, if it is a grudge, it, it it burns out like a candle burns out. Just is that your personality type, or is that a learned practice? I don't know what it is. I think it might be a learned. I might. I don't know. You know, I have to go back. I have to go back to the nuns a little bit. They were neat ladies, and every, every time I say. I was taught by none. Oh, the ones that beat the hell out of you. I said, no, they did not do that. They were neat ladies. If you got the shit beat out of you, you deserved it. You had it coming. You had it coming. You were probably an asshole. But I had aunts and cousins that were nuns. So I was very uh, used to nuns. And uh, just, uh, well, real quick, uh, my, uh, my pip here was to my grandfather. He was uh, 12 kids in the family. Hmm. He was born in 19, uh, 1895. But anyway, in, a, in all those pictures of uh, genealogy books and all that, all those big French, oh, but had at least 9, 10, 15 kids. And there's always a nun or a priest. In the group. In, in the picture. Yeah, yeah. Or both. Mm -hmm. It was just a, it was a very, very common. Yeah. So one of his older sisters became a nun. And her father's name was August Augustine, my great grand great grandfather. Yeah, his name her <coughs> name was uh, uh, Julian, and uh, so she became a nun. And he, she his name was Augustine, so she took her name as Sister Saint Augustine. <laughs> oh, that's cool. It's clean. Yeah, that's cool. So I'd go to the a, a convent where she not too far out in the country, and I'd ride my bike. But oh God, I rode my bike. Oh, that was my buddy. And I rode the bike to the convent. She was at that convent. I knock on the door, and she'd come to the door. And we'd walk around the grounds, and she'd always give me cookies or something like that. And so I was ready to go back. I did it quite often during the summers. She would grab one of my handlebars. She says, Kenneth, pray for me. Please pray for me. Mm -hmm. So I got on my bike, because I was going through farm country. Why do I need to pray for a nun? Yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't put She's got the market corners. Like, you think she'd have that? <laughs> and I, I vaguely knew <coughs> sister, the other cousin, Sister Ambrosia. And, but I got to go to their 50th anniversary. They became nuns at the same time. So my, my pip here, it was his sister, so he got permission to take the two nuns back to the big farmhouse he, they lived in. And so the whole family was there, just all the French all over the place, They're talking French and all that. He came up to his sister. She was in the full garb. You know what the full garb is. He whispered to her, do you want a highball? And she said, yeah, I'd like to have a highball. And I was, I was 14. I thought, that's disgusting. <laughs> she tried the damn thing, though. <laughs> but, oh, yeah. man. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, it is a tradition. It seems like there was always uh, someone that was going to go into the, 
to the church. Oh, that, you have to go back to the turn of the century before that, like 1875, 1885, 1895. Yeah, that was the doctor of the family. Like that's, oh, and look, look here, Ken. Yeah. He's yeah. becoming a priest. Aren't you proud? You know. Yeah. Well, I thought of becoming a priest, but uh, it went. Yeah. Well, Barbara was uh, your calling. Well, yeah. Barbering. Barbering. <clears throat> well, I love that. Well, I'm grateful for our, the time that you've uh, been able to dedicate to our podcast. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Ken has a, a rich history, and we are grateful to have that history and uh, his experiences here on the American Masterminds. As we tell these stories and we're learning, what lessons are there here for you to learn that you can bring into your life? And um, the advice that Ken would give him, his young self and um, choose joy, choose happiness. You can make a choice every day. I think that that's, some, that's a real gold nugget that I try to adhere to and so grateful for that. Um, please subscribe to the podcast and tell your friends, uh, like and comment. And uh, we look forward to seeing you on the American Masterminds in the near future. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.